Welcome to Tanakh Talk. You make it really hard for me to be serious. <laughs> That's hilarious. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingston, Texas, USA, with another episode of Two Guys Exploring Christianity with this crazy guy, Greg the Man McBride. Welcome, welcome back, brother. He's crazy. <laughs> we was having a lot of fun there for a second. All right, good deal. Okay, so today we're going to uh, be discussing um, is the God of Israel, is he one God or is he three? And doubled up with, is the law a curse? Like Galatians 3.10 says, these are some great topics. Yes. Uh, be good two and one to knock out of the show today. Um, so one, once again, welcome back, Mr. McBride. And, uh, Thank you, sir. Can't wait for the discussion. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> okay, our, we'll do our compare and contrast verses today. First, oh. they're Galatians 3.10. And I will read that out of my trusty King Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Okay, that's what the... That's what Paul says in Galatians. Now, if we flip back to Deuteronomy, we go to the 27th chapter, to the 26th verse, and it says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of the law, to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Right on. Okay, and yeah. real quickly before, while that's still settling in your head, we'll go to make sure we understand, we go to Jeremiah eleven three, and say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of of this covenant. Now, Christian, uh, fence setter, one person who's trying to decide, is, is Judaism correct? Is Christianity correct? What did the prophet say, Moses and Jeremiah? They said that you are cursed if you do not obey the law. That's very clear. But in Galatians, Paul says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Yeah. For it is written, everyone that continueth not in all the things that are written in the book. Can, can you see the complete 180? Yeah. The, the law is to do in the Hebrew Bible, but Paul makes it into a curse. By the way, this is not the only place that that he calls the law a curse in the in the Christian scriptures. But I'm my my main focus on on showing these is Paul does not quote Deuteronomy or Jeremiah. He changes it. That's that's the whole point of this. And when I was a young man uh, last month, <laughs> uh, yeah. I would read I would read this in my Bible. Remember, under my covers at night, I'd read this. Well, what does a fourteen year old boy think when he reads this? I didn't know anything about Moses. I didn't know anything about Jeremiah at the time. So I read this. Of course, what am I going to think? Well, that that law was a curse. It was a curse for them. And that's that's what the church reinforced then in my life. And then that's what I that's how I've come to where I'm at now because I'm reading these again right. in the same King James Bible. So so we're going we're going to discuss that and we are we're going to finish up with the the birth narratives. Oh, by the way, 
Mr. Solberg is next week now right. for the viewers. So and um, and uh, well, we're going to record next week, uh, and it was so we'll record next Tuesday, and that will actually air live. And it will be different than the one with McClatchy. We're going to have a full-on discussion. So that way, by the time we're at the end of the hour, uh, we will have all gotten in on all of our thoughts. Uh, with with McClatchy, we're waiting on a on a rebuttal. Um, not really sure if that's going to happen or not, but uh, hopefully it will. Um, so this this way, it'll just be better for everybody. All right. So we've got these three. Realistically, all it takes is one, though. All it takes is one absolute blatant contradiction to derail somebody's new statement. And right here, there's Correct. clearly two. And I know there's a couple more because I've actually stumbled across them in the prophets myself. But this, the, the, these, I, I just never saw them. I never saw those before. So that's really cool. I'm glad you brought these up. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so I know you discussed you wanted to go over and close in some ideas and, and final thoughts on the birth narrative. So if you right. want to, we can go yes. We can go that way. Yeah, so, so we. why do we have... Two such different birth narratives? That's a great question. Matthew's narrative is by far the most offensive to the Jewish people. Remember, Moses, Moses, when he was a child, do you remember when Pharaoh killed the babies, the baby boys? Right. Matthew is trying to cast Jesus as this new Moses. And that's very important because remember, who is Matthew writing to? He's writing to a Jewish audience. That I, that's why I still think that Matthew is after Luke. That's irrelevant. So we, but we get a very, uh, a, not so subtle, but we get very clear demons and allies in the, in the account of Matthew. So the Magi, the kings from the east, they're not Jewish. In other words, they're, they're, we would have to consider that they are pagans. In, in the Hebrew Bible, if you're not a member of Judaism, if you're not a member of the Jews, a member of Israel, you're known as a heathen. That, that's not derogatory. I mean, in a way it is, but it's just the way that the Hebrew Bible kind of delineates between the people groups. In other words, Hashem chose Israel, and that's the only nation that he chose to be his people. That does not mean that non-Hebrews are second-class citizens, but they're known as heathens. So these these wise men that come from the east, they're not of the nation of Israel. They would be known as heathens or Gentiles. They're the ones that know that Jesus is being born. See, the the Pharisees and the scribes, the the people who are the most steeped in the Torah that you can be. They don't get it. They're not, they're not in. These Gentiles have to come and tell them, hey, your Messiah's being born. Okay? So they go to Herod. Herod's a Jew. Okay? He's, he's a member of Israel. What does Herod seek to do? Herod, of course, seeks to kill the child. Then we get to Pilate and his wife. This is the only, Matthew's the only book that we have where Pilate's wife has a dream. And she tells Pilate, hey, don't mess with that Jesus, because last night in a dream, I, I, I had a dream not, that we're not supposed to mess with him. Pilate's a Roman, his wife a Roman. Then we get probably the worst story, or the worst in the entire uh, in the entire Hebrew by or in the entire Christian Bible. Herod or Pilate says in twenty seven twenty four, "I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself." 
speaking to the Jews. And the Jews say, may his blood be upon us and upon our children. Today, in Indiana, Jewish people are known as Christ killers. That's just a fact. Today, the world over, Jewish people are known as the Antichrist. It all comes from this passage in Matthew where the non-Jews, the kings from the east, Pilate and his wife, they get it. They know who Jesus is. The Pharisees, they don't know. And then by extension, the mob of people that are there, they don't know who Jesus is either. And they, in some I, I I don't know how this could ever be because my grandparents could not say, hey, I'm going to, whatever crime I, they're going to commit, hey, this is going to be on my great-grandson, Greg McBride, also. Okay, I'm not even born yet. Right. I have no culpability whatsoever, and neither do the Jewish people. They do not. So don't underestimate how anti-Semitic the Christian Bible is. That's, and, and you go into churches today and, oh, we're not anti-Semitic, we're not anti-Semitic, then, then explain how this isn't anti-Semitic to me. Do you in the church believe that the Holy Spirit breathed these words for a person that we don't know exactly who it was, but he breathed these words into this person's heart and he recorded them for us. They're very anti-Semitic. There's, there's one little thing and this, this gets a little bit, um, this gets a little contrived, but it's important in Luke. We are told that Quirinius became the governor. We're told that Quirinius is the governor Okay, Quirinius becomes the governor of Syria in six of the common era. Okay, we know this from from the history of the Roman Empire. Archelaus is Herod's son, and he is so corrupt that he is removed, and Quirinius becomes the governor. So If Jesus is born during Herod's reign, just like Matthew says, then Quirinius is not the governor of Syria. If Matthew is correct and Jesus and Herod are together, they're contemporary, then Luke's statement that Quirinius is the governor cannot be true. So there's that little... And believe me, I'm going to, on this show, I'm going to always be the least scholarly person. All right? I don't have, like I said, I don't have any credentials. I don't, I, I don't quote a lot of people. But I do study the history of the Bible, and I study the history of the era. And so basically you have, you have to decide which account is correct because they're 10 years apart the birth of jesus is 10 years apart according to the christian bible and that's that's my whole point here is that according to them it's 10 years apart so the the one fix that i have recently heard is they found another corinius uh, okay um I, again viewer you have to be, is this plausible? This is, for 2,000 years, there's only been one Quirinius. Well, now there's, now we've found another Quirinius. So, sure sounds like damage control to me. It sounds like damage control. Yeah. And it, it really does. And so just just keep that in mind. What, what I'm doing here is, and, oh, Mr. McClatchy from last week, thank you again for being on the show. Um I'm trying to build a, a 
uh, case, so to speak, that has multiple, multiple attestations. If, if I need to give you 30, I'll give you 30. I'll give you 50. Um, I, I want it to be clear. So uh, I want to look at this law being a curse. Again, this is a very common theme in the, in the Christian Bible, right. that the law is a curse. One of the best places for us to, to learn this is in the book of Deuteronomy, the same one where we just went to chapter 27. 20, and, uh, so we were in 29 originally, so you're saying go to 27? Well, uh, we were in 27, 26 originally. Oh, uh, I must have, must have or, dropped. Or no, 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 no. Where were we at? I think uh, you, may, you, may be, you may be right. Yeah, 27. Yeah, 26, you're right. Yeah, 27, 26, yeah, yeah. Um, and we're uh, in, to... in chapter 27, let's, let's just start in 27 here. This will be good. Okay. Uh, 27, if you go to verse eight, we are told Moses is, is Moses and the elders of Israel are gathered and Hashem is speaking. And he says, you shall write all the words of this Torah on the stones plainly and well. All right, this is what there's no and and the the curses begin right after this. If you don't follow the Torah, you're cursed. If you make a graven image, you're cursed. If you make light of your father and mother, you're cursed. If you move a boundary marker, these are all parts of these are all parts of the Torah. the The Torah contains six hundred and thirteen commandments. And seven rabbinic commandments. And the Exodus account of the Ten Commandments is 620 letters. <laughs> it's just, oh. just a little sidebar for you there. So That's 613 cool. commandments from Hashem, 713, or seven rabbinics, and 620 is the total of them all. And that's the number of letters in the Torah in the section of the Ten Commandments. So there's a, there's a lot of laws. Most, many, not most, many of the laws from the Torah do not apply to non-Hebrew people. And Mr. Solberg that we'll have on next week, his book called Torahism is about that. And in a, he's, he's a lot more correct, I think, than he knows, um, because there is a movement in Christianity that William and I were both a part of, it's the messianic movement. Yes. And in that movement, you basically try to keep the Torah. I, I will tell you now, Christian who is watching the show, don't try. <laughs> I, just don't. Do not try to start keeping the Torah. You will fail. It is not required I, I have discussions with rabbis. Um, Rabbi Skobek and I talked about this because I asked. I I assumed from my Christian vantage point that in the Messianic Kingdom I would be keeping all the dietary laws and all the uh, the Sabbath laws and everything. And he said there's no indication of that. Now, right. it, it could be, it could be, but there's no indication that the the Noahides like William and I, there's no indication that we'll be required to keep it then. Right. We, would we be, will just have to worship Hashem. We, we would be allowed to, but we wouldn't be allowed we, to do it, to try to do it the way God told Jewish people to. But like, like we can correct. eat kosher if we want to. We can keep the holy days, but we can't like have a full-blown Passover Seder because that, that didn't involve me. I wasn't there. The Jewish people were right. And so, if, if <clears throat> yes, if somebody right. would have told me what William just said 15 years ago, <laughs> my, my life would have been a lot easier. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. I am very serious because you, the viewers are probably getting a sense of me. I read it and I try to understand it. And when I read what it says, I think that's exactly what I should do. And I, I fail the I I have in the past failed the ultimate context test. 
and that is, and here's what the, the church really fails this ultimate context text. The context of the Hebrew Bible is that it is to the Hebrew people. That's the right. context. Right. We, we flirt around with context on all different things, but we have missed the big context. So Christian, please, when you're reading the Hebrew Bible, read it in the context that it is written for the Jewish people, for the sons and daughters of Jacob. That's who it's written to. And every rabbi stresses that I know that you are not a second-class citizen, not by any means, right. but you just need to learn to understand. So in context, the thing about context is you can't build context by taking away text. You can only build context by adding it. Correct. And so funny thing, Rabbi Federal last night said something really pretty neat, a little saying. He says, context without the text leaves nothing but a con. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty good right there. That's, that's right true, there. yes. Yeah. And that, that context is important in like um, uh, Christians. Okay, I do understand this. I see this in my life that Christianity is moving towards a more Jewish understanding. And so a Christian preacher gets a hold of a concept of halakha. Okay, and halakha means literally it means building fences around the Torah. And they say, well, there you go. See those rabbis? Can I They're chime? building fences. Sure. Can I chime yes. in there? So uh, I've understood yeah. halakha. Uh, of course, the, the, there's a word for walking, and it's, yeah. it's it might be holake, but it's kind of a, it's it's the root word from halakha. And I've always heard that the word the word halakha literally means the way, like a, like a pathway, like the way, right. the, the, the road to how they follow the Torah, which would include Correct. fences and keeping guidelines. Yes. Yes. Very yes. Good. Very yes. Good. That's, that's perfect. But Christian preachers and apologists get a hold of this and they say, well, there you go. See, this is the right. No, here's the best way that I've, boy, I'm way off topic again, but here's the best way that I've heard it explained. I like these rabbit trails. To be honest with you, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's say this would be this would be one. If I were Jewish, this would be one of my shortfalls. I I'm a businessman, and I I I like to make money. I do. I really do. I I don't worship money in any way, shape, or form. But I I'm always much to the chagrin of my secretary and some of my people. I'll always tell people. I hardly ever tell people no. So my, my bent would be to want to work on the Sabbath and work on the high holy days. All right. So since, since you are forbidden from working on the Sabbath or on the high holy days, for a person like me who might want to earn money on those days, we're going to set up a halakha that says, I won't touch money on those days. I won't touch my tools on those days. It, it's not in the Torah that I can't touch a tool or that I couldn't touch money on those days. But to keep me from my natural proclivity to work when I shouldn't work, the rabbis set up fences to help me keep the commandment of the Torah. And that's, that's the best way to understand that, is to, to, to have those types of impediments in place to where I'm, I'm going to do something that doesn't really break the Torah, but... As I start to do that, I realize, oh, the next step is that I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to break the Torah. I'm going to break a commandment. And so I stop that, that fence, so to speak. And to be honest, with, okay, I don't think, I, I'm positive Abraham never needed a fence. <laughs> right, um, right. There are, there are 
righteous Jews today that don't need fences. A lot of us need fences, and that's the that's just a fact. And so, again, Christian, if if you decide when you see like, okay, yeah, our New Testament authors they just completely changed what the Hebrew Bible said, and I I think we want to stop going and listening to people lie about what the Hebrew Scripture said. Don't think that you have to start keeping the Torah, and because you don't. Your best thing to do is, and I, I online now you can find rabbis that will help you along the way. Well, this this show even can help you along the way. But now, so keep, keeping the just just for uh, further clarification, so um, they don't have to keep the laws of purity, the laws of kosher laws, the holiday of laws. But you, if you really are. Um, if you are seeing where this, where we're coming from, where this channel is leading, and you feel like this is definitely the halakha, the pathway, the the road for me, yeah, you know, then of course the parts of the Torah that would apply to you would be things like, you know, I mean, you can't be involved in pagan worship, idolatry, things like that. Right. So, uh, yeah. so you can, like I said, you can you can start observing Passover. Just don't try to keep it to like the way that God told the Jews to do it. And you know, right. you, you want to take off on on Saturday, you can, but you don't have to. You know, right. so, yeah. um, but yeah, yeah so you, you're more than welcome to, to, to participate in the Torah and, uh, but uh, something I'd still don't understand, but this is the thing is you, you don't have to eat kosher. You can eat pork if you want to. Now I don't right. myself because I just think, and it's kind of weird, but, uh, but you yeah. can, you know, so as, as a non-Jewish person, you know, now if you decide to convert to Judaism, then of course all that changes. Then, right. Yeah. All that changes. So, but there's no need all to convert. Right. So anyway, go ahead. Right. Yeah. You don't have to. So. Okay, if you go to chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, you will read at the very the very first verse. And it shall be, if you diligently obey the voice of Hashem, your Elohim, to guard to do all his commands, which I command you today, that Hashem, your Elohim, shall set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of Hashem, your Elohim. So remember when Paul's writing in Galatians in the third chapter, just, just for a moment, think of the 180-degree turn that he made. Hashem here is clearly telling us Blessings come to you if you keep the Torah. Paul says curses come to you if you try to keep the Torah. The church says curses come to you if you try to keep the Torah. I really think, and this is, this is a little bit more of, of the esoteric, but I really think that oftentimes New Testament authors are scanning the Hebrew Bible, and and Paul scanned the Hebrew Bible because I I 100% do not think Paul is a, a Pharisee. Um, they scan the text, and he's scanning the text. And in the previous verse, in the previous chapter, chapter 27, these curses are here, and so oh, these curses. This is the Torah. In other words, you can do this yourself. I did it in school several times. If you're cramming to get something done and you just scan through it and you miss some big important marker and you go, you, you get the wrong idea. I, th I think that's what happened. I, they, how you would come to the conclusion that the Torah teaches that the law or the commandments are a curse, you just have to not understand the Torah. And I think that's what Paul did. So, um, uh, let's go to verse, uh, let's, let's flip over to chapter 28 and we'll go to verse 58. Hashem is giving the, uh, this, the progeny that will come forth. He's trying to talk to them also, the the seed that will come forth 
out of the nation of Israel. And he says, if you do not guard to do all the words of this Torah that are written in this book, to fear this esteemed and awesome name, Hashem, your Elohim, then Hashem shall bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and lusting, great and lasting plagues, and grievous and lasting sickness. And again, we are absolutely clear here. Moses is 100% clear. There is no reason for you to get this wrong in the church other than just willful ignorance or ignorance. Because what hap how do you get cursed? According to Hashem, you get cursed by not keeping the Torah. At the very end of chapter 29 in, in Deuteronomy, in verse 29, the secret matters belong to Hashem, our Elohim. But what is revealed belongs to us and to our children forever to do all the words of this Torah. You know, I find it one of my favorite verses right there. 29, 29, the secret, oh, secret that's things. A, that is a cool verse. Interestingly cool, enough, cool if verse. the Christians feel like the, the secrets were revealed to them, though. But this clearly Correct. says, this, this literally says forever. It yes. doesn't say temporarily yes. until the Messiah might come. It says forever. No. No, one one of the things that Paul is really good at in in the in the Christian Bible is he's always talk he like he talks about the mystery of iniquity and he's always talking about the mysteries that are surrounded his his interactions with what he perceived was Jesus. And some of the things he says, well they're just a mystery and you've got to basically just believe Jesus. How much does this get? How does this get clearer? The the mysteries, the secret matters. They belong to Hashem. That's that's who. Now, I think Hashem has revealed uh, through the ages certain mysteries to His people. W biggest one I can think of, just off the cuff, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up the the uh, calculation, but. The, the great sage Hillel, it was revealed to him how long the lunar day is on earth. Because remember, we don't have a temple after the temple is destroyed. So the way of calculating when the new moons are, when the Passover is, when the feasts are, it went to a, to a calendar or to a... To a um, way of doing it without being in the land. And I believe the calculation, it's 29.5109 something, the length of the solar day. It is still the most accurate today. The Hebrew calendar is accurate to within one day every 14,000 years. The Julian calendar that preceded our current Gregorian calendar, which was named after me, um, <laughs> it <laughs> the, the Julian. Oh, well, of course. You just got you just got a new nickname, <laughs> by the way, Gregorian <laughs> McBride. <laughs> the, Ju the Julian was was accurate to one day in three thousand years. The Gregorian, named after Pope Gregory, uh, was was accurate to one day in seven thousand years. And the Hebrew calendar today is one day in 14,000 years. A, a, a skeptic said, well, why wouldn't, if, if Hashem told Hillel how long it was, why did he make a one day error in 14,000 years? And the answer is because there's not 14,000 years of time of that schedule. is allotted for man <laughs> to roam That's, the earth. <laughs> that is a fantastic answer. Absolutely, the Messiah. The Messiah will return before yep, the Hebrew calendar is off by a day. <laughs> that's hilarious. So, so that's that's real clear. And this and the it is so hard for a Christian to realize that they're not 
the people of God. Because in church, if you've ever been in church, you are the soldiers of Jesus, you're the people of God, you're the chosen people of God. Yep, the adopted. But, but yeah, you're replaced. adopted in, and, and those Jews that were of natural branches, they are lopped off and they're thrown into the fire. Yep. Now, and that is just clear teaching, but you have to contrast that teaching with what Moses says. How long are the children of Israel they are forever. How how long? Oh, this just this just crossed my mind. The how long do the children of Israel have to do the words of the Torah? Well, until Jesus comes. And that's a common teaching. Jesus fulfilled that law. You know, you he, he did, you know. No, they have to continue doing the Torah forever. Very clear teaching here in Deuteronomy. Now, if you go to the, the next chapter and go to the sixth verse, this is vital for you in the church. Because one of the real teachings in the church, I taught it myself m multiple, multiple, multiple times. And that is in the New Testament, we are, we are told clearly by Paul, that there's no such thing as circumcision anymore, meaning physical circumcision of a male. But now God is interested in the heart, and that this is a very clear Christian church teaching. Not only is it erroneous that, that physical circumcision of male children is not done, Paul says famously, I, I believe it's in Galatians, where he says famously that if you're going to circumcise, you basically you might as well castrate. So this this verse, if you go to the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 6, and Hashem your Elohim shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, heart of your children, to love Hashem your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, so that you might live. And where does it say the description for what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart? It literally says you shall do these commandments, do, do all of these commandments. The Torah. That, that is how yes. you do it. That's, that's that is how you're, and in, in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, where, where Hashem writes the Torah on the heart of the Hebrew people. Yeah. That's the whole, that's when, when Hashem writes the Torah on the heart of all the people, that's when everybody doesn't need fences anymore. That's when they know, like Moses knew, remember, please, remember this, please, don't, don't fall for the Abraham's faith is why God picked him. That is untrue in the 17th chapter of Genesis where we read that Abraham believed God. He believed God in that he believed God would do what he said he was going to do. Didn't have anything to do with salvation for, for Abraham or for a place in the world to come for Abraham. All you have to do is go nine chapters later in the exact same Hebrew book, and go to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5, and you read that Abraham kept the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances, just like Zechariah and Elizabeth did, according to Luke chapter 1 verse 5, for the Christian viewer. He kept the commandments. That's why he was a righteous man. It didn't have anything to do with belief in Jesus. We are told, and this, this will be one of the questions for a future guest, uh, Jesus himself, in the 20th chapter of John, says, if, if you would have believed, if you would have, if you, basically, if you would have understood what Moses was trying to tell you, you would know that he was talking about me. I mean, that's Jesus himself says that. 
No, I'd like to know where that's at. Again, in the in the Hebrew canon, I'd like to know where that we are told told that from Moses. If you go down to the tenth verse of chapter thirty, if you obey the voice of Hashem your Elohim to guard His commandments and His laws, which are written in this book of the Torah, if you turn back to Hashem your Elohim. With all your heart, with all your being, for this command which I am commanding you today, it is not too hard for you. Yep. Right. It is not far off. I, I cannot count the number of times, I'm sure this is the case for you too, William, because we were both in the church for a long time. We were both very deeply into the church. Right. We are always taught that the Torah is too hard to keep. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. In the church? Absolutely. That's exactly what we're taught. A absolutely. That's exactly what's taught. And that you, it was a curse, of course, which you covered it's already. It's a curse, and it's too hard to keep. So, yep. again, Christian viewer, you, you, have to, <laughs> you have to figure this out because— uh, I'm not getting any younger. William's <laughs> getting younger, but I'm not. And so the Torah is not too hard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not. And guess what? It's like a thousand times easier for us Gentiles. It really is. Yeah. Most of the, of the Noahide commandments, the Noahide laws, if you just, I, I, hate, I can't hardly say this in our modern world, but I would normally say, if you just like be normal, you've probably covered ninety percent of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just just be normal. Be be courteous. Be normal. Be honest. Um, I'm not. I, I. It has never been a a uh, temptation for me to cut a limb off of an animal and let the animal live. Right. Um, and my grandpas would have been aghast if I would have ever done such a thing as that. You know, they, well, I know back in, in the words, day, I know they, I, I think the reason why they did it was because they didn't have refrigeration. Correct. And yeah, they, they wanted the animal to keep living and it was torturous. So yeah, I get correct, that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah but so thank my God. My grandparents, yeah. my grandparents didn't have refrigeration right. until much later. My grandpa McBride was born in 1891. <laughs> so, See, I told you you were old. He was 50, <laughs> What? I, said, I told What'd you, you were old. <laughs> what did you say? That is old. <laughs> no, I said I told you you were old. <laughs> oh, and that's true. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah we're talking. My about dad was fifty, when, or my grandpa was fifty when my dad was born. <laughs> nice. That's that's cool. So, that's cool. Um, there's a story I would I'll tell you in private sometime about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not appropriate for the show. Okay. <laughs> so, but we we are we are crushing. Christian mist, no Christian. I, I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, Christ, I was gonna say Christian mist teaching. I'll leave it at that. Okay, we're, we're That's crushing fair Christian mist teaching about the Torah. Right. Okay. It, it's it is the path to righteousness. It is not too hard. It is it in the church. You get these questionnaires a lot of times. What's God's will for your life? That's a big one, you know. Especially when you're when you're newly inducted into the church. Hey, what's God's will for your life? And I say, well, it's will Yum Hall. And that's, that's so a good one too. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, amazingly, that was God's will for my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, but. God's will for your life is is very easy. Yeah. Keep keep my Torah. You keep my Torah and you're gold. You don't have to go like uh, conquer in my name and cast out demons in my name and get millions of converts in my name. If you just keep the Torah, you've you've been exceedingly successful. You're in the top echelon. Yeah. So it's not as hard. And again, it's so much easier for us. So 
if you skip down, oh, we, no, we're not going to skip. We're going to go to verse 12. What, cha- what were you at? Book and- uh, we're in chapter 30 still of Deuteronomy. Okay. So we, we were just told that the, the Torah is not too hard for you. It's not far off. It is not in the heavens to say, who shall ascend in the heavens for us? Bring it down and cause us to hear it so that we may do it. It's not beyond the sea. So you have to say, who's going to go over the sea to get it for us and bring it back to us so we can hear it? The word is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart to do it. And remember context, big context. This is the children of Israel. We are about to, not we, they, are about to lose Moses. They're very... They're very troubled by this. Um, so the, the entire emphasis is, look, you don't have to go someplace and do a great work. It's right here. I just gave it to you. I just gave it to you. It's right here. In... In Christianity, of course, salvation had to come from heaven and then return to heaven. So, uh, again, showing the... Not only do I want to contrast the literal verses from the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Bible, I want to contrast the very uh, 180-degree different concepts of how our creator interacts with us and what he expects from us. So I have, and this is one of the two big places where we learn the fallacy of the idea of Satan being evil and opposed to Hashem. The other place that you will find this is in Isaiah chapter 45, verse nine. Um, I, I'm, I'm positive I've got that one right. Um, verse 15, see, I, Hashem is speaking, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil in that I am commanding you today to love Hashem, your Elohim, Walk in his ways, guard his commandments, his laws, his right rulings. You shall live and increase, and Hashem, your Elohim, shall bless you in the land which you go to possess. I I cannot, I if if a preacher would just get up on Sunday morning and read two chapters from Deuteronomy. Just read it. Don't, you don't have to say one thing about it. Just read it. A lot of your members are going to have to get up and walk out. And I, that's not my goal either. I hope, I hope your members stay and they begin to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with you as their person who shows them where the stuff's at in the Hebrew canon. And you can just do this on your own. And this the is cursing. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, the thing that is in my mind about this, but even before I left the church, it was, I didn't understand if these were the light, the final words of Moses. I mean, this was his final warning. <clears throat> if you want to call it that uh, final blessing, yeah. final curses. And he said, this, this is how you are to move forward. And these are his last, basically his last month's worth of speaking is in Deuteronomy, you know, right. And he's telling yep. you, telling you this right here to keep that to keep these commandments to walk in his statutes walk in his judgments uh that you may right. live and he tells you choose life or death whatever you want to choose right right so yeah and then and then you have all the prophets that we have that we see and all these prophets are of things to come this is what you are to look for very specific things it tells us to avoid idolatry and, and you know very right. very clear things kind of like we mentioned last week um yeah and so <clears throat> what i what i what i never understood was if, in fact, there was going to be some final instructions for God's people, 
you know, before, let's say before Jesus came, uh, who the Christians think their Messiah is, before then, the, the final words that were given is what we should be following, not something some new, right. new guy brought in. You right, know, so yeah. like when we used to, when my kids were young, um, I used to tell them when we go to the store, because they like touching things. I said, nope, keep your hands in your pockets. And I said, no <laughs> coveting, no wanting. Keep your hands in your pockets. Every time yeah. we would go to the store, I would say, very, very, right before we go in the store, I'd say, okay, just like just before we go in the promised land, you remind them what those rules are. And then, and then yeah. you go. So why why all of a sudden would would God send somebody else to contradict everything? It's not right. like he, yeah. he he like was supporting these things and then added qualifiers that made sense that went in line with them. But they totally violate everything God ever said. Why would right. that that yeah. that doesn't make any logical sense? And that was very confusing no. to me. Yeah, very confusing. If if the viewer will read, so the longest chapter in the Hebrew canon is the 119th Psalm. If you will read the 119th Psalm, which King David is writing, and underline every place, because if you're one of the cool people like me, you've already done this, underline every place in the 119th Psalm where David speaks about the Torah, and then read what he says about the Torah, See how long he confirms that the Torah lasts. David himself says it lasts forever. He says famously at the very beginning of the chapter, the Torah is like a light or a lamp unto a young man's path. And I I didn't read that until I was mm. an old man. <laughs> and I, I I you know I'm I'm hoping that I can convey this. I'm not being very successful at this. I'm hoping I can convey this to my children who are still young men that the Torah is the light. The Torah is the lamp. And again, in, in the church, Jesus is the light. That's just the way it is. But David doesn't agree. He says that the Torah is the lamp unto a young man's feet. And as a matter of fact, I'm just going to, that bears reading. Um, uh, uh, blessed are it's a 119th Psalm, uh, verse 9. How would a young man cleanse his path to guard it according to your word? I have sought you with all my heart. Let me not stray from your commands. I have treasured up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Um, open my eyes that I might see wonders from your Torah. Uh, blessed are the perfect in the way who walk in the Torah of Hashem. Blessed are those who observe his witnesses who seek him with all their heart. Yes, they shall do no unrighteousness. Remove from me the way of falsehood and favor me with your Torah. Make me understand that I might observe your Torah and guard it with all my heart, that I might guard your Torah continually forever and ever. Does that sound like anything you will hear in a church nope. this coming weekend? Not a clue. You will, you will never hear anything that even resembles that closely. Right. You, you might hear something about, oh, you know, be good, be good to your neighbors, or you will, this, the, and I, I read maybe, oh gosh, 10% of what David says in the 119th Psalm, but the, the flavor, the, the passion that he has for the Torah is undeniable. And David is one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had. He's not the greatest, um, but he is one of the greatest kings. And he's a man after God's own heart. Uh, wow, that's that's hard to... <laughs> yep. you, you talk about Abraham gets called the friend of God, which you talk about... Okay, again, sidebar here. Can you imagine the privilege of a that the position that Abraham holds? He gets to be called the friend of God. <laughs> and 
not only that, but his son and grandson, today people refer to the one true God, the creator, as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh my word. <laughs> how do you yeah. how do you get in that club? And then David is a man after God's own heart. Now, obviously God doesn't have a heart. Um if he does, it's probably part of the triunity of the Godhead. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. That you know, that's a, that's another one, you know. But yeah. The the position and the stature of these men is overwhelming to me. Uh, like I said, you and I know some rabbis that I just really respect. and But yet, if they stood in the presence of Abraham or in the presence of Moses, Moses, known as the greatest prophet Israel ever had, or in the presence of King David, despite his flaws, despite all their flaws, to stand just in the same county <laughs> with those guys, yeah, the, right. the privilege of that. And then to realize that in the world to come, I get to go up to Jerusalem and I bet, and I guess is, I always raise my hand when it's conjecture on my part. So this is 100% conjecture on my part. I have no no backup for this. I I might get to meet them. I I might get to meet Abraham. I might get to meet Sarah. I, I, I might I might get to do that. And and then to real and and then sh the shooting's all over, so to speak. You know what I mean? But but they were the ones that were in the they were the Sergeant York. Remember Sergeant York from World War II? he was in the midst of the battle he was he was a warrior like crazy these men were too in in a world of idolatrous pagans they stood out and they they were the great men of god so uh i i, I talk way no that's way too good much. I also say that I talk way too much, too much. <laughs> <laughs> now, no, we were we were going to uh, discuss, and we made did we do it already? Is God one or three? That was part of our. Uh, we we have not. I I did want to touch. Uh, let's touch base on that so, real yeah, fast before we close. Let's up. touch base before we close here. I'm okay. I'm going to bring up. Um, uh, yes, and and remember that Moses is uh, Moses is going to not be the king of Israel or the, the prophet of Israel anymore. And he is not going to be the leader of Israel anymore. The people are upset. Joshua is going to take over and that's pre done in the United States. We're very upset that Mr. Biden will be leaving office in the two years and that somebody else will be taking over. Oh. So <laughs> it's probably not the same. So, one one of the big objections to the the oneness of God in the Christian world, and I will I'll, I'll try to do this quickly. I've got it written down, so I can go through it without flipping. Uh, in Genesis one, chapter verse twenty six, twenty seven, we get this, and God said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness." So God created man in His image, in the image of God, He created him. Okay. We are told that this is very clear reference to the plurality of the Godhead or the the triunity of the Godhead. Let's read, and again, like I said, I'm the least intellectual, the least scholarly of pretty much any person you're going to hear on this channel. <clears throat> but I do have some Christian authors that have written about this recently. I'm going to quickly read them. G.J. Wenham, Christians have traditionally seen Genesis 126 as adumbrating the Trinity. Adumbrating just means foreshadowing or theophany is, a, is a, an adumbrating. Big word. Big word. All right. It is now universally admitted that this was not what the plural meant to the original author. 
and that is from Word Biblical Commentary on Genesis, Word Books, 1987. The NIV Study Bible, which is universally known in the church as the not inspired version, God speaks as the Creator King, announcing His crowning work to the members of His heavenly court. Grand Rapids, Zondervan, 1985. The Ryrie Study Bible. Plurals of Majesty. Liberty Annotated Study Bible. The plural pronoun us is most likely a majestic plural from the standpoint of Hebrew grammar and syntax. That's from Jerry Falwell. Keel and Delich. The plural we was regarded by the fathers and earlier theologians almost unanimously as indicative of the Trinity. Modern commentators, on the contrary, regard it either as pluralis majestatus. No other explanation is left, therefore, than to regard it as pluralis majestatus. And that's from Keel and Dutch, the commentary on the Old Testament. I, I apologize. I promised certain rabbis that I would not say those two words together on this program anymore. Huh. <laughs> but anyway, so now real quickly again, we're not one thing the church does is it focuses on one verse. Genesis 1, 26. First Kings 22, 19, Micah continued. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high, lifted up. His train filled the temple. Seraphim stood above. Each one had six wings. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 26. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Jeremiah 23, 18. But which of them, the false prophets, has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word? But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways. Job chapter 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also with them. Job 15.8. Do you listen in on God's counsel? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? This idea of a heavenly court is throughout the Hebrew Bible. The fact that the heavenly court exists does not in any way indicate that Hashem himself is a multi person Godhead. This is clear. This is very clear. But my last point I'm going to make from the Christian Bible, and you're going to have to figure this out. We will go quickly to the book of Hebrews, and we're just going to go to the very first chapter. I'm going to read you six verses beginning with verse 1. God, who in sundry times and in divers manners spake in the past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Remember, this is the yeah. same as John yeah. chapter 1 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much... Now, don't miss this. <laughs> don't miss this. 
This is not the main point, but this is like a <clears throat> chapter four, verse one. Being made so much better than the angels. Please, Christian, <laughs> how is Jesus present at the creating when he himself, according to this, was made a little higher than the angels, a little better than the angels. And he hath by inheritance, are you following this? Please, please listen. By inheritance hath obtained a more excellent name than they. Not, not a, <laughs> just a more excellent name than the angels. The angels is what this is referring to. I, my father doesn't inherit anything from me. You know why? Because my father and I are not the same. I cannot inherit things that my father doesn't have. In other words, this is, this is crazy. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, this is Hashem, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, this is the this is the keyest verse to the, the ludicrousy that there is three people creating. And again, verse 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten, when God brings Jesus in to the world, he saith, Hashem saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Christian, I beg of you, just use your brain. Why? How? What would be the re if Jesus is the one who created the angels? How could he? Come why would worse? the Father have to tell the angels to worship him? Uh, it, wouldn't the angels know when they were created who their creator was? Yeah. How could they not? I, again, I'm not bringing a rabbi in here. I'm not bringing a Talmud in here. I'm not bringing the Tanakh in here. I'm using your Christian King James Bible. And Hashem tells the angels to worship Jesus. Wow. Wow. But I'm expected to believe that since in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says, let us make man. That that was Jesus and John chapter one, that and and this this text even controverses itself because it says at the beginning it agreed with John one one that Jesus is the creator yeah. here in Hebrews, but then it makes him a created in verse four, and then in verse six the ultimate creator Hashem has to tell the angels it's like. And and I, I'm engaging, or I'm going to find this out in my own company, and this is always a hard part for any company that gets started by a, an ADHD guy like me, <laughs> <laughs> that I, I'm the boss. But I will, I will die in another 60 years because Moses said I can live to be 120. So, <laughs> so, so when, a, when the son takes over a business, there's almost always problems. I don't ever have to tell my people to listen to me, but sometimes I have to tell my people to listen to my son. I, I, and, I, that's, and, and again, if you've ever been in business or worked for a business or started a business, you know that I'm telling you the exact truth. Yeah. It's just the way it is. Everybody knows that I'm the creator of the business, yeah. and my son has worked for me also, since he was five years old, my grandson works for me at 11 years old now. But I have to tell my people to listen to my son. So, again, this is, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I'm becoming a little more emboldened 
the more that I study myself, um, and I'm, I'm becoming less scared to just bring this stuff right. to the front. So you know, in in the Hebrews uh, you're mentioning, and, and also John, <clears throat> I found it interesting that in John three sixteen it says that uh, that he is the only begotten Son. It says right. for God's, that God gave his only begotten son. I won't put that on screen. I thought I had it on screen, but I guess not. Right. There it is. It says God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then you go into Ezekiel, or did I not put that? No, Psalms. Psalms 2, 7, and it says, I will tell you the decree. Uh, the Lord has said to me, talking to King David, you are my son. This day I have begotten you. So how is Jesus Correct. his only begotten son when David clearly said he was begotten, the, his begotten Correct. son also? Yes. You know? Yes, and then you're bringing Solomon. In, yeah, yeah. Solomon's yeah. a son of God. Yeah. Israel's a son of God. In in chapter two of Psalms, the the Christian Bible, totally. I even know what the Hebrew word for son is. It's mm -hmm. Ben. Yeah. Okay. And it, if you go down through through the second Psalm and you get to the bottom in a Christian Bible, it will say it'd be verse twelve or thirteen, I believe. It will say. Kiss the sun. Mm, yeah. But that's not what it says. Right. It says desire purity right. or yearn for purity. That's that's what it says. But in, of course in the Christian Bible, it says kiss the sun. Of course, their claim is the, that that's in Aramaic, which is why they it's say Aramaic. It. It's, that, that's, it's that's, Aramaic. It's Aramaic. It's that's da, da, da. Okay. But but in, I believe oh no, I'm not sure about this I believe in Aramaic this the word is also Ben it's bar actually. I'm not sure about bar. is it what bar ball yeah bar. Bar, bar 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 yeah I knew it was close but but bar yeah but the word bar doesn't appear there it says yeah. desire purity right I think in that's what 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 psalm is that I want to make sure I get that right number right two here. psalm Psalms psalm two. number two oh yeah let's see let me look that up and it would last. be uh. Because it, it says, David, you are my son, and then it would be thir 12 or 13. It's not, It's a short chapter. Thir 12 or 13 Psalms two, would be the yeah. verse. Okay. 12. Well, 212. Okay, yeah. Okay, it yeah. says, uh, let, me, let me zoom in there real fast. Just so uh, we can have it on screen. I got it right here. I have so many of these things framed up. I don't know which one is. Oh, uh, <laughs> hang on just a second. Scale that up to get it large enough where you can read it. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it does say bar. Um, let's see. Yeah, Nishikuru bar. So yeah. bar, not Ben. So again, that but it. Yeah. That's just that's just their claim that it's that it says the they say bar is uh, is a an Aramaic word for uh, for son, but that's this isn't but, Aramaic. This is Hebrew right here. It's not right. Aramaic. Yeah, it's so Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. So, the only that I know that. I know that the last six chapters of, or no, the first, no, the last six chapters of Daniel are written in Aramaic. Um, right. The first six in Hebrew, because Daniel doesn't write the first six chapters of the book that is named after him. They're written by the Greek council, which would mm -hmm. have been um, Ezra, or not Ezra, would have been... Uh, uh, oh, Micah. I, I believe Micah would have been a part of that great, that great council. Uh, it would have been 120 members, but that that's the great assembly is the one that wrote the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. Um, and then, then that seventh chapter is both Daniel, right? But it, it ties the book together the Hebrew and the Aramaic, it ties, it stitches the book together. Um, it's fascinating what you can learn from good rabbis, <laughs> if you, if you can remember it. <laughs> so, but yeah, so That's I'm, nice. I'm just, I, again, I'm, I'm begging you to just read, just read. Um, and you'll, you can learn so much. So. My brother. Well, I think we had a full Thank hour you. out there, Ron. You had a what? I think we got us a full hour there of content. That's oh, great. I think we did. Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. And you know, this interesting is because there's so many, um, 
uh, that's one thing I like about this show is like we can talk about the same topic 10 shows in a row and every single show use different content to talk always about always something different yeah yeah, yeah. i mean and time. i i really do have an adh brain adhd brain yeah. and i see you, I you just proved you just proved it you only went to adh and you got distracted <laughs> i know i was trying to get on to the next word i was going to say <laughs> I, yeah i just snorted don't ask okay <laughs> All normally right. William normally William whips his <sighs> microphone down before he snorts, yeah. belches, or sneezes. <laughs> right. Right. That's funny. I do I do. I do. Now, you know, I, I say this every single show and I'm gonna do it right now because apparently I can't not I can't remember to do it off the show. So uh-huh. my email address <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> William <laughs> at T A N A C H T A L K dot com. Thank you. I finally got that in there. Now let's see if that'll take. And it did. And now we're going to make this thing go live again. And there you go. Finally, after all these years, I finally put my email address on there. Uh, So William... I am am still getting lovely emails. That's great. That's great. Thank thank you so much. Um, William and I are going to be together in, in Dallas, Texas in July. I'm going to bring my laptop. I told William one time that he could just have access to all my emails, and he said, oh, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I have too many of mine to but start with. I, I know. Yeah. Right, we're going to sit down. We're going to take an hour down in Dallas. We're going to sit down. We're going to go through my emails. We're going to we're gonna format like the next two months of shows. That's a great idea. Based on my – based on the e- – because I, I really appreciate it. I really do. Yeah. I get – really good emails from from really beautiful people and i i sincerely mean that um it it is a you don't realize how much of an encouragement you are to me um when you send me emails some of them that don't agree with everything that i've stated on this show and i really appreciate that i really do um so just uh I'm I'm very grateful to yeah. you for those. That's good. So. That's good. All right. Okay, my friend. Well, uh, thank you all once again for tuning in. And this has been a fun two guys exploring Christianity. And look look soon uh, for the video coming from us and Professor Solberg. Uh, it'll it'll yes. be we're just going to do it all in one show. And that way it'll just be an easier, it'll be one complete package in one. It may go over an hour, maybe, I'm not really sure. But we're going to try to keep it as close to an hour as possible. And then uh, when we're done with this topic, and if he's open-minded, we'd like to come back on again for us to address another question that that would be uh, for a a Christian apologist to to try to answer, then we will certainly explore that avenue, no doubt about it. So, Okay, my friends, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you guys a little bit later. My friend Greg McBride. Mr. Mr. Greg uh, Gregorian McBride. <laughs> Greg, Gregorian. <laughs> there you go. Show him, everybody. We'll see you later. Peace. Thank you. Bye. Well, my dear friends, hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shaifa